You're listening to The Partially Examined Life today, bringing you a special presentation as we read through a play that we will then discuss on our next full episode. The play in question is Timon of Athens by William Shakespeare and Thomas Middleton, written probably around 1605. I'm Mark Linsenmeyer. I'll be reading the stage directions and various little parts. Let's briefly go around and have the cast introduce themselves first. The titular role, our Timon. Jay Sanders. I am Timon O. Athens. And you can just IMDB these people. You've seen these people in things. I've been around. I've worked with Michael. That's right. And Michael, what is your part? I'm Michael Ian Black. I'm playing Appamantus. The philosopher of the cynic school. Another TV actor, Michael Toe. Introduce yourself. Hi, Michael Toe. I'm playing Alcibiades. All right. And then we are very pleased to have a co-editor of the edition we're reading. Sir Jonathan, introduce yourself. I'm Jonathan Bate, co-editor of the RSC Shakespeare second edition, just out, which you are reading. And I am playing Flavius, the loyal steward and servant of Timon. And then there are over 30 parts in this. Those four are the only ones whose names anyone will remember. Let's have the ensemble folks introduce themselves. Bill. Hi, I'm Bill Humans. I am playing the old man of Lucullus, first lord etc. Thanks, Bill, for coming back and for connecting us here with Jay and with our next Sarah. Introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Sarah Manton. I am coming to you from a cupboard in New York City. And (laughs) I worked with Bill, and I'm happy to be here. And my frequent pretty much pop guest, Sarah Lynn, introduce yourself. I am Sarah Lynn Breck. I'm a writer and a writing professor. And today I get to be an actor. But you were an actor at some point, right? Like 20 years ago. All right. Well, that's why I contacted you (laughs) because of that 20-year-old experience. Keep the expectations low. (laughs) Speaking of that, yes, all us regular (laughs) podcast hosts are on here. Hi, this is uh, Seth Paskin in Austin, Texas, one of the co-hosts of the podcast. And amongst other roles, I am going to be the painter. I'm Dylan Casey here in Midland, Michigan, and I am playing... The jeweler. This is Wes Alwyn, co-host. I'll be playing Merchant and some other small things. So this takes place in ancient Athens. Jonathan, can you set us up very briefly? We're going to have a whole discussion with you next week, so we don't need to get in too much, but just set it up for the folks what this play is. Timon is a very rich guy. And you know what it's like with rich guys? Everybody wants to be their friend. So he has parties, he has banquets, he has poets trying to get him to be their patron, painters trying to sell him paintings, jewelers trying to sell him jewels. They all love him, but of course he runs out of money. And once he runs out of money, most of them just don't want to know. Other really interesting thing about this play is of all Shakespeare's plays, it's the one that has the fewest female parts. In fact, there's a couple of prostitutes who have a cameo appearance, but otherwise I'm afraid it's all men. But when a world is all men with no women, things don't go so well. No family either. You know, all the time, Shakespeare's other plays, fascinated by family relations, parents and children, siblings. Again, Timon, no family, just friends, but they're not all very good friends. So this is five acts... A bunch of scenes in each will kind of stop maybe after every scene, recap for the audience what just happened in case anybody is totally lost and maybe reintroduce who's going to play what in the next. Because it's, as you say, it's it's Timon and uh, a few of these people visiting him and then society. (laughs) So it's many lords. And in general, it was Sarah, Sarah Lynn and Bill playing the lords and the, you know, the people, whether he he's giving them gifts or they're trying to collect money from him or whatever. And then us podcasters are the servants. But there's so many servants in some of these <laughs> scenes that we break that <laughs> fairly constantly. Act one, scene one, we four podcasters are playing the poet, painter, jeweler and merchant. We're all hanging around waiting for uh, time to show up. And it begins. Good day, sir. I'm glad you're well. I have not seen you long. How goes the world? It wears, sir, as it grows. Aye, that's well known. But what particular rarity, what strange, which manifold record not matches? See, magic of bounty, all these spirits thy power hath conjured to attend. Ah, I know the merchant. I know them both. The other's a jeweler. Oh, tis a worthy lord. Nay, that's most fixed. Most incomparable man, breathed, as it were, to an untirable and continued goodness. He passes. 
I have a jewel here. Oh, pray, let's see it. For the Lord Timon, sir? If he will touch the estimate, but for that. When we for recompense have praised the vile, it stains the glory in that happy verse which aptly sings the good. Tis a good form. And rich, here's a water, look ye. You are wrapped, sir, in some work, some dedication to the great lord? Mm, a thing slipped idly from me, our posy is as a gum which oozes from whence tis nourished. The fire in the flint shows not till it be struck, our gentle flame provokes itself, and like the current flies, each bound it chafes. What have you there? A picture, sir. When comes your book forth? Upon the heels of my presentiment, sir. Let's see your piece. Tis a good piece. Mm, so tis. This comes off well <laughs> and excellent. Indifferent. Admirable. How this grace speaks his own standing. What a mental power this eye shoots forth. How big imagination moves in this lip. To the dumbness of the gesture one might interpret. It is a pretty mocking of the life. Here is a touch. Is it good? I will say of it, it tutors nature. Artificial strife lives in these touches, livelier than life. Enter certain senators. How this lord is followed. The senators of Athens, happy men. Look, more. You see this confluence, this great flood of visitors? I have in this rough work shaped out a man whom this beneath would doff, embrace, and hug with amplest entertainment. My free drift halts not particularly, but moves itself in a wide sea of wax. No leveled malice infects one comma in the course I hold, but flies an eagle flight bold and forth on, leaving no track behind. How shall I understand you? Uh, I will unbolt to you. You see how all conditions, how all minds, as well as of glib and slippery creatures as of grave and austere quality, tender down their services to Lord Time and his large fortune upon his good and gracious nature hanging subdues and properties to his love and tendance, all sorts of hearts, yea, from the glass-faced flatterer to Epimantus, that few things loves better than to abhor himself. Even he drops down the knee before him and returns in peace, most rich in Timon's nod. I, I saw them speak together. Sir, I have upon a high and pleasant hill feigned fortune to be throned. The base of the mount is ranked with all deserts, all kinds of natures that labor on the bosom of this sphere to propagate their states, amongst them all whose eyes are on this sovereign lady fixed. One do I personate of Lord Timon's frame, whom fortune with her ivory hand wafts to her, whose present grace to present slaves and servants translates his rivals. Tis conceived to scope. This throne, this fortune, and this hill, methinks, with one man beckoned from the rest below, bowing his head against the steepy mount to climb his happiness, would be well expressed in our condition. Nay, sir, but hear me on. All those which were his fellows but of late, some better than his value, on the moment follow his strides, his lobbies fill with tendance, rain sacrificial whisperings in his ear, make sacred even his stirrup, and through him drink the free air. Aye, Mary, what of these? When fortune in her shift and change of mood spurns down her late beloved, all his dependents which labored after him to the mountain's top, even on their knees and hands, let him fly down, not one accompanying his declining foot. Tis common. A thousand moral paintings I can show that demonstrate these quick blows of fortunes more pregnantly than words. Yet you do well to show Lord Timon that mean eyes have seen the foot above the head. Imprisoned, is he, say you? Ay, my good lord, five talents is his debt, his means most short, his creditors most straight. Your honorable letter he desires to those have shut him up, which failing periods his comfort. Noble Ventidius! Well, I am not of that feather to shake off my friend when he must need me. I do know him a gentleman that well deserves a help which he shall have. I'll pay the debt and free him. Your lordship ever binds him. Commend me to him. I will send his ransom. And being in franchise, bid him come to me. It is not enough to help the feeble up, but to support him after. Fare you well. All happiness to your honor. Enter an old Athenian. Lord Timon, hear me speak. Freely, good father. 
Thou hast a servant named Lucilius. I have so. What of him? Most noble Timon, call the man before thee. Attends he here or no? Lucilius! Here, at your lordship's service. This fellow here, Lord Timon, this thy creature, by night frequent my house. I am a man that from my first have been inclined to thrift, and my estate deserves an heir more raised than one which holds a trencher. Well, what further? Only one daughter have I, no kin else on whom I may confer what I have got. The maid is fair, of the youngest for a bride, and I have bred her at my dearest cost, in qualities of the best. If this man of thine attempts her love, I prithee, noble lord, join with me to forbid him her resort. Myself have spoke in vain. The man is honest. <laughs> Therefore he will be. Timon, his honesty rewards him in itself. It must not bear my daughter. Does she love him? <laughs> she is young and apt. Our own precedent passions do instruct us what levity is in youth. Love you, the maid? Aye, my good lord, and she accepts of it. If in her marriage my consent be missing, I call the gods to witness I will choose mine heir from forth the beggars of the world and dispossess her all. How shall she be endowed if she be mated with an equal husband? Three talents in the present... In future, all. This gentleman of mine hath served me long. To build his fortune, I will strain a little, for tis a, a bond in men. Give him thy daughter. What you bestow in him, I'll counterpoise and make him weigh with her. Oh, noble lord, pawn me to this, your honor. She is his. My hand to thee, mine honor on my promise. Humbly I thank your lordship. Never may that state or fortune fall into my keeping which is not owed to you. Exit Lucilius and old man. Vouchsafe my labor and long live your lordship. I thank you. You shall hear from me or not. Go not away. What, what have you there, my friend? A piece of painting, which I do beseech your lordship to accept. Painting is welcome. Uh, the painting is almost a natural man. For since dishonor traffics with man's nature is but outside, these penciled figures are even such as they give out. I like your work. And you shall find I like it. Wait attendance till you hear further from me. The gods preserve ye. Well, fare ye, gentlemen. Give me your hand. We must needs dine together. Sir! Your jewel hath suffered under praise. What, my lord, dispraise? A mere satiety of commendations. If I should pay you for it, as tis extol, it would unclear me quite. My lord, tis rated as those which sell would give, but you well know things of like value differing in the owners are prized by their masters. Believe, dear lord, you mend the jewel by wearing it. <laughs> well bought. No, my good lord, he speaks the common tongue, which all men speak with him. Enter Epimantus. Look who comes here. Will you be chid? We'll bear with your lordship. <laughs> He'll spare none. Good morrow to thee, gentle Apamantus. Till I be gentle, stay thou for thy good morrow. When thou art Timon's dog, as thee, and these knaves honest. Why dost thou call them knaves? Thou knowest them not. Are they not Athenians? Yes. Then I repent not. <laughs> you know me, Apamantus. Thou knowst I do. I called thee by thy name. Thou art proud, Apamantus. Of nothing so much as that I am not like Timon. <laughs> Whither art thou going? To knock out an honest Athenian's brains. That's a deed thou die for. Right. If done doing nothing, be death by the law. I like thou this picture, Apomantus. The best, for the innocents. Wrought he not well that painted it? He wrought better that made the painter, and yet he's but a filthy piece of work. You're a dog. Thy mother's of my generation. What's she, if I be a dog? 
Wilt dine with me, Appamantus? No, I eat not, lords. And thou shouldst, that's anger ladies. Oh, they eat lords, so they come by great bellies. That's a lascivious apprehension. So thou apprehendst it. Take it for thy labor. How dost thou like this jewel, Appamantus? Not so well as plain dealing, which will not cost a man a doit. What dost thou think tis worth? Not worth my thinking. How now, poet? How now, philosopher? Thou liest. What, art not one? Yes. Then I lie not. Art not a poet? Yes. Then thou liest. Look in thy last work, where thou hast feigned him a worthy fellow. That's not feigned, he is so. Yes, he is worthy of thee, and to pay thee for thy labor. He that loves to be flattered is worthy of the flatterer. Heavens, that I were a lord. What wouldst thou do then, Appamantus? Even as Appamantus does now, hate a lord with my heart. What, thyself? Aye. Wherefore? That I had no angry wit to be a lord. Art thou not a merchant? Aye, Appamantus. Traffic confound thee if the gods will not. If traffic do it, the gods do it. Traffic's thy god, and thy god confound thee. What trumpet's that? Enter a messenger. Tis Alcibiades, and son twenty horse, all of companionship. Pray entertain them, give them guide to us. You must needs dine with me, go not you hence till I have thanked you. When dinner's done, show me this piece. I'm joyful of your sights. Enter Alcibiades with the rest. Most welcome, sir. So, so there, aches contract and starve your supple joints, that there should be small love amongst these sweet knaves, and all this courtesy, the strain of man's bred out into baboon and monkey. Sir, you have saved my longing, and I feed most hungrily on your sight. Right welcome, sir. Ere we depart, we'll share a bounteous time in different pleasures. Pray, pray you let us in. Exit all except Appamantus. Enter two lords. What time of day is it, Appamantus? Time to be honest. <laughs> that time serves still. The most accursed thou that still omitst it. Thou art going to Lord Timon's feast? Aye, to see meat fill knaves and wine heap fools. Oh, fare thee well, fare thee well. <laughs> thou art a fool to bid me farewell twice. Why, Appamantus? Shouldst have kept one to thyself, for I mean to give thee none. <laughs> Hang thyself. No, I will do nothing at thy bidding. Make thy requests to thy friend. Away, unpeaceable dog, or I'll spurn thee hence. I will fly, like a dog, the heels of the ass. He exits. He's opposite to humanity. Come, shall we in and taste Lord Timon's bounty? He outgoes the very heart of kindness. He pours it out. Plutus, <laughs> the god of gold, is but his steward. No mm. mead, but he repays sevenfold above itself. No gift to him, but breeds the giver a return, exceeding all use of quittance. The noblest mind he carries that ever governed man. Long may he live in fortunes. Shall we in? I'll keep you company. They exit. Yay, that's the end of scene one. And scene two is more of the same, more partying. With, uh, <laughs> with, is it even worth saying who's playing what? Let the audience we, guess. All right, we're going we're gonna to get some servants here. We're going to get, uh, Jonathan is Flavius finally. We're going to get Seth on a new part. We're getting the Lords back, mostly the same characters. Look out for when dancers come in led by Cupid. <laughs> that's a that's a high point all right act one scene two the hot boys playing loud music a great banquet served in and then enter lord timon the states the athenian lords alcibiades and ventidius which timon redeemed from prison then comes dropping after all Epimantus, discontentedly like himself ventidius talks most honored timon it hath pleased the gods to remember my father's age and call him too long peace he has gone happy, and has left me rich. Then, as in grateful virtue I am bound to your free heart, I do return those talents, doubled with thanks and service, from whose help I derived liberty. Oh, by no means. Uh, honest Ventidius, you mistake my love. I gave it freely ever, and there's none can truly say he gives if he receives. 
If our betters play at that game, we must not dare to imitate them. Faults that are rich are fair. <sighs> A noble spirit. Nay, my lords. Ceremony was but devised at first to set a glass on faint deeds, hollow welcomes, recanting goodness, sorry ere tis shown. But where there is true friendship, there needs none. Pray, sit. More welcome are ye to my fortunes than my fortunes to me. I thought we always have confessed it. Oh, ho, confessed it. Hanged it, have you not? Oh, uh, Abamantus, you're welcome. No, you shall not make me welcome. I come to have thee thrust me out of doors. Fine, thou a churl. You've got a humor there does not become a man. It is much to blame. They say, my lords, irafura brevis est, but yond man is ever angry. Don't let him have a table by himself, for he does neither affect company, nor is he fit for it, indeed. Let me stain at thine apparel, time, and I come to observe, I give thee warning on it. I take no heed of thee, thou art an Athenian, therefore welcome. I myself would have no power, prithee let my meat make thee silent. I scorn thy meat, would choke me. For I should never flatter thee. Oh, you gods, what a number of men eats Timon, and he sees them not. It grieves me to see so many dip their meat in one man's blood, and all the madnesses he cheers them up to. I wonder men dare trust themselves with men. Methinks they should invite them without knives, good for their meat and safer for their lives. There's much example for it. The fellow that sits next him now parts bread with him. Pledges the breath of him in a divided draft. Is the readiest man to kill him. Tas been proved. If I were a huge man, I should fear to drink at meals, lest they should spy my windpipe's dangerous notes. Great men should drink with harness on their throats. My lord, in heart, and let the health go round. Let it flow this way, my good lord. Flow this way? A brave fellow, he keeps his tides well. Those healths will make thee and thy state look ill, Timon. Here's that which is too weak to be a sinner. Honest water, which ne'er left man in the mire. This and my food are equals. There's no odds. Feasts are too proud to give thanks to the gods. Immortal gods, I crave no pelf. I pray for no man but myself. Grant I may never prove so fond to trust man on his oath or bond, or a harlot for her weeping, or a dog that seems a sleeping, or a keeper with my freedom, or my friends if I should need them. Amen. So fall to it. Rich men sin, and I eat root. Much good ditch thy good heart, Apamantus. Captain Alcibiades. Your heart's in the field now. My heart is ever at your service, my lord. You had rather be at a breakfast of enemies than a dinner of friends. So they were bleeding new, my lord. There's no meat like him. I could wish my best friend at such a feast. Would all those flatterers were thine enemies, then that thine thou mightst kill him and bid me to him? Might we but have that happiness, my lord... If you would once use our hearts, whereby we might express some part of our zeals, we should think ourselves forever perfect. Oh, no doubt, my good friends, but the gods themselves have provided that I shall have much help from you. How had you been my friends else? Why have you that charitable title from thousands? Did not you chiefly belong to my heart? I have told more of you to myself than you can with modesty speak in your own behalf, and thus far I confirm you. Oh, you gods, think I, what need we have friends if we should ne'er have need of them? They were most needless creatures living, so we ne'er have use for them, and would most resemble sweet instruments hung up in cases that keeps their sounds to themselves. Why, I have often wished myself poorer, that I might come nearer to you. We are born to do benefits, and what better or properer can we call our own than the riches of our friends? 
Oh, what a precious comfort it is to have so many like brothers commanding one another's fortunes. Oh, joys, even made away ere it can be born. Mine eyes cannot hold out water, methinks. To forget their faults, I drink to you. Thou weeps to make them drink, Timon. Joy had the like conception in our eyes, and at that instant like a babe sprung up. Oh, I laugh to think that babe a bastard. I <laughs> promise you, my lord, you moved me much. Much! What means that Trump? How now? Enter servant. Please you, my lord, there are certain ladies most desirous of admittance. Ladies? What are their wills? There comes with them a forerunner, my lord, which bears that office to signify their pleasures. I pray, let them be admitted. Enter Cupid with the mask of ladies. Hail to thee, worthy Timon, and to all that of his bounty's taste. The five best senses acknowledge thee their patron, and come freely to gratulate thy plenteous bosom. Their taste, <laughs> touch, all, pleased from thy table rise. They only now come but to feast thine eyes. They're welcome all. Let them have kind admittance. Music, make their welcome. You see, my lord, how ample you're beloved. Enter the masks of Amazons with lutes in their hands, dancing and playing. Hoy day, what a sweep of vanity comes this way. They dance, they are mad women. Like madness is the glory of this life, as this pomp shows to a little oil in root. We make ourselves fools to disport ourselves, and spend our flatteries to drink those men upon whose age we void it up again, with poisonous spite and envy. Who lives that's not depraved or depraves? Who dies that bears not one spurn to their graves? Of their friend's gift, I should fear those that dance before me now would one day stamp upon me. It has been done. Men shut their doors against a setting sun. The lords rise from table with much adoring of Timon, and to show their loves, each singles out an Amazon and all dance, men with women, <laughs> a lofty strain or two, the hot boys, and cease. You have done our pleasures much grace, fair lady. Set a fair fashion on our entertainment, which was not half so beautiful and kind. You have added worth unto it and luster, and entertained me with mine own device. I am to thank you for it. My lord, you take us even at the best. Faith, for the worst is filthy and would not hold taking, I doubt me. Ladies, there is an idle banquet attend you. Please you to dispose yourselves. Most thankfully, my, my lord. Cupid and the ladies <laughs> exit. Flavius. My lord. The little casket bring me hither. Yes, my lord. More jewels yet. There's no crossing him in his humour, else I should tell him well. If faith I should, when all spent, he'd be crossed then, if he could. Tis pity bounty had not eyes behind, that man might ne'er be wretched for his mind. Where be our men? Here, my lord, in readiness. Our horses. Oh, my friends, I have one word to say to you. Look you, my good lord, I must entreat you to honor me so much as to advance this jewel. Oh. Accept it and wear it, kind my lord. I am so far already in your gifts. So are we all. Enter a servant. My lord, there are certain nobles of the Senate newly alighted and come to visit you. They are fairly welcome. I beseech your honour, vouchsafe me a word. It does concern you near. N near? Why, why then, an another time I'll hear thee. But I prithee, let's be provided to show them entertainment. I scarce know how. Enter another servant. May it please your honour, Lord Lucius, out of his free love hath presented to you four milk-white horses trapped in silver. I shall accept them fairly. Let the presence be worthily entertained. Enter a third servant. How now? What news? 
Please you, my lord, that honorable gentleman, Lord Lucullus, entreats your company tomorrow to hunt with him, and has sent your honor two brace of greyhounds. I'll hunt with him, and let them be received, not without fair reward. What will this come to? He commands us to provide and give great gifts, and all out of an empty coffer. Nor will he know his purse, or yield me this to show him what a beggar his heart is. Being of no power to make his wishes good, his promises fly so beyond his state that what he speaks is all in debt. He owes for every word. He is so kind that he now pays interest for it. His land is put to their books. Well, would I were gently put out of office before I were forced out. Happier is he that has no friend to feed than such that do even enemies exceed. I bleed inwardly for my lord. You do yourselves much wrong. You bait too much of your own merits. Here, my lord, a trifle of our love. With more than common thanks, I will receive it. Oh, he's the very soul of bounty. And now I remember, my lord, you gave good words the other day of a bay courser I rode on. Tis yours because you liked it. I beseech you, pardon me, my lord, in that. You may take my want, my lord. I know no man can justly praise but what he does affect. I weigh my friend's affection with my own. I'll tell you true. I'll call to you. Oh, Oh, none none so so welcome. welcome. I take all and your several visitations so kind to heart tis not enough to give. Methinks I could deal kingdoms to my friends, and ne'er be weary. Alcibiades, thou art a soldier, therefore seldom rich. It comes in charity to thee, for all thy living is amongst the dead, and all the lands thou hast lie in a pitched field. Defiled land, my lord. We are so virtuously bound. And so am I to you. So infinitely endeared. All to you. Lights, more lights! Best of happiness, honor, and fortunes keep with you, Lord Tyler. Ready for his friends. What a coil's here, serving of becks and jutting out of bums. I doubt whether their legs be worth the sums that are given for them. Friendship's full of dregs. Methinks false hearts should never have sound legs. Thus honest fools lay out their wealth on curtsies. Now, Apomantus, if thou wert not so sullen, I would be good to thee. No, I'll nothing, for if I should be bribed too, there would be none left to rail upon thee, and then thou wouldst sin the faster. Thou givest so long, Timon, I fear me thou wilt give away thyself in paper shortly. What needs these feasts, pomps, and vain glories? Nay, and you begin to rail on society once I am sworn not to give regard to you. Farewell, and come with better music. He exits. So, thou wilt not hear me now, thou shalt not then. I'll lock thy heaven from thee. Oh, that men's ears should be to counsel death, but not to flattery. And he exits. Hey, we finished the scene. Yay! And the act, that was act one. Very good. And now a word from our sponsors. Do members of your household eat differently? Do you want to eat healthy but need some way to make it easier, even more fun? Green Chef can help you out. Now owned by HelloFresh, Green Chef now gives you more customization than ever before with new organic and wild-caught protein options. Now PAL listeners can enjoy both brands at a discount. You can swap the protein in any meal that features chicken, beef, or salmon to suit your tastes, and the recipes will be delivered to you, tailored to you, directly to your front door. Green Chef is the number one meal kit for eating well with dinners that work for you, not the other way around. They have options for every lifestyle. Keto and paleo, vegan, vegetarian, fast and fit, Mediterranean, and gluten-free. My personal fitness regime has me eating a lot of protein lately, so I've been taking advantage of the paleo meals and the Mediterranean meals. I'm delighted with the time-saving recipes packed with fresh produce and vibrant flavors, all of which gives me more time to get out and enjoy my favorite season, summer. 
Go to greenchef.com slash PEL135 and use code PEL135 to get $135 off across five boxes and your first box ships free. Go to greenchef.com slash PEL135 and use code PEL135 to get $135 off across five boxes and your first box ships free. Green Chef, the number one meal kit for eating well. This episode of the Parcel Examined Life is brought to you by Buck Mason. Buck Mason was was kind enough to send me a bunch of sample clothing not too long ago, and I had actually been meaning to shop there for a long time. We have a brick and mortar store in Boston, and I've always liked the look of the clothing. Now that I've been wearing it, I really like the way they look on me. They kind of have a timeless, never go out of style quality to them. Everything fit great right out of the box, and many of the Buck Mason items I have have become favorites, kind of go-to items. The curved hem tee in particular is really fantastic. Once you try Buck Mason, they'll become your go-tos as well. Head over to buckmason.com slash P-E-L and get 15% off when you spend at least $100. That's B-U-C-K-M-A-S-O-N dot com slash P-E-L to get 15% off when you spend at least $100. Buckmason.com slash P-E-L. Can we give the audience, get them up to speed? I mean, it was Timon just being generous to a bunch of people. He gave away some horses. He gave away some money to let Ventidius, Seth, free from jail. He praised all these musicians and, and bought the thing from the painter and the, uh, the poet. We got some banter with Appomattis. Anything I missed there? Any plot beats? He gave away should... a, a dowry to a servant. Yes, yes. Lucillus. And some the... jewels. And when Ventidius, whose dad has died and he's rich and offers to give the money back to him, he says, no, I'm not taking anything back. Yes. And he's given a uh, bounty from someone else and he says, I'll give you better. Yeah. I'll give you back something more. He's bound and determined to empty his coffers and then some. But he doesn't seem to be aware. And Flavius, who's keeping the accounts, is the only one who knows there's nothing left in those coffers. Exactly. And in fact, he's leveraged, right? Yeah. Act two is when we will now see the bills come due. Seems like Flavius probably should have said something before this. <laughs> but he keeps I trying and trying to win this. Yes, he's trying very hard. I understand. Okay. <laughs> Flavius, I appreciate I, you I on the like sidelines. This, this is weeks in coming, if not years in coming. Flavius could have said, hey, buddy. Yeah. He, he tries Slow to tell him again and again. All right. All right. That sounds like Appomantis for sure. <laughs> Act two, scene one. Enter. A senator. And late 5,000 to Vero and Isidore, he owes 9,000, beside my former sum, which makes it five and 20. Still in motion of raging waste? It cannot hold, it will not. If I want gold, steal but a beggar's dog and give it Timon. Why, the dog coins gold. If I would sell my horse and buy 20 more, better than he. Why, give my horse to Timon. Ask nothing, give it him. It folds me straight and able horses, no porter at his gate, but rather one that smiles and still invites all that pass by. It cannot hold. No reason can sound his state in safety. Caphis, ho, Caphis, I say. Here, sir, what is your pleasure? Get on your cloak and haste you to Lord Timon. Importune him for my monies. Be not ceased with slight denial, nor then silenced when commend me to your master. And the cat plays in the right hand, thus... But tell him my uses cry to me. I must serve my turn out of mine own. His days and times are past, and my reliances on his fracted dates have smit my credit. I love and honor him, but must not break my back to heal his finger. Immediate are my needs, and my relief must not be tossed and turned to me in words, but fine supply immediate. Get you gone. Put on a most importunate aspect, a visage of demand, for I do fear when every feather sticks in his own wing, Lord Timon will be left a naked gull, which flashes now a phoenix. Get you gone. I go, sir. I go, sir? Take the bonds along with you and have the dates in. Come. I will, sir. Go. Across town, enter the steward Flavius with many bills in his hand. No care, no stop, so senseless of expense that he will neither know how to maintain it nor cease his flow of riot. Takes no account how things go from him, nor resume no care of what is to continue. 
Never mind was to be so unwise, to be so kind. What shall be done? He will not hear till feel. I must be round with him now he comes from hunting. Fie, 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 fie. Enter Caphis, meeting servants of Isidore and Varro. Good even, Varro. What, you come for money? Is it not your business too? It is. And yours too, Isidore? It is so. Ugh, would we were all discharged. I fear it. Here comes the Lord. Enter Timon and his train, including Alcibiades. So soon as dinner's done, we'll forth again. My Alcibiades, with me, what is your will? My Lord, here is a note of certain dues. Dues? Whence are you? Of Athens here, my Lord. Go to my steward. Please it, your Lordship, he hath put me off to the succession of new days this month. My master is awakened by great occasion to call upon his own, and humbly prays you that with your other noble parts you'll suit in giving him his right. Mine honest friend, I prithee but repair to me next morning. Uh, nay, good, good, my lord. Contain thyself, good friend. One Vero servant, my good lord. From Isidore, he humbly prays your speedy payment. If you did know, my lord, my master wants... T'was due on forfeiture, my lord, six weeks in past. Your steward puts me off, my lord, and I am sent expressly to your lordship. Give me breath! I do beseech thee, good my lords, keep on! I'll wait upon you instantly. Exit Alcibiades and lords. Come hither. Pray you, how goes the world that I am thus encountered with clamorous demands of broken bonds and the detention of long-since-due debts against mine honor? Please, you gentlemen, the time is unagreeable to this business. Your importunacy cease till after dinner, that I may make his lordship understand wherefore you are not paid. Do so, my friends. D see them well entertained. Pray, draw near. Uh, they exit. Enter Appomantis and fool. Oh, stay, stay. Here comes the fool with Appomantis. Let's have some sport with him. Hang him, he'll abuse us. A plague upon him, dog. How dost, fool? Dost I along with thy shadow? I speak not to thee. No, tis thyself. Come away. And there's a fool hangs on your back already. No, thou stand single. Thou art not on him yet. <laughs> Where's the fool now? He last asked the question. Poor rogues and usurers, men, bawds between gold and want. What are we, Appomantus? Asses. Why? That you ask me what you are and do not know yourselves. Speak to them, fool. How do you, gentlemen? Gramercy's good fool. How does your mistress? She's even setting on water to scald such chickens as you are. Would we could see you at Corinth. Good, Gramercy. Enter a page. Look you, here comes my master's page. Why, how now, Captain? What do you in this wise company? How dost thou, Alpamantus? Would I had a rod in my mouth that I might answer thee profitably. Prithee, Alpamantus, read me the subscription of these letters. I know not which is which. Canst not read? No. There will little learning die then that day thou art hanged. This is to Lord Timon, this to Alcibiades. Go. Thou wast born a bastard, and thou die a bawd. Thou wast whelped a dog, and thou shalt famish a dog's death. Answer not, I am gone. He leaves. Even so, thou outrunnest grace. Fool, I will go with you to Lord Timon's. Will you leave me there? If Timon stay at home, you three serve three usurers. I would they serve thus. So would I, as good a trick as ever hangman served thief. Are you three uh, usurers, men? I fool. I think no usurer, but has a fool to his servant. My mistress is one, and I'm her fool. When men come to borrow of your masters, they approach sadly and go away merry. But they enter my master's house merrily and go away sadly. The reason of this? I could render one. Do it, then, that we may account thee a whore master and a knave, which notwithstanding thou shalt be no less esteemed. What is a whore master, fool? A fool in good clothes, and something like thee. Tis a spirit. Sometimes appears like a lord, sometimes like a lawyer, sometimes like a philosopher with two stones more than's artificial one. He is very often like a knight, and generally in all shapes that man goes up and down in from fourscore to thirteen, 
The spirit walks in. Thou art not altogether a fool. No, thou art altogether a wise man. As much foolery as I have, so much wit thou lackst. That answer might have become Appamantus. Aside, aside, here comes Lord Timon. Enter Timon and Steward. Come with me, fool, come. I do not always follow lover, elder brother, and woman. Sometime the philosopher. Exit Appamantus and fool. Pray you walk near, I'll speak with you anon. You make me marvel, wherefore ere this time had you not fully laid my state before me, that I might so have rated my expense as I had leave of means. You would not hear me at many leisures I propose. Go to, perchance some single vantages you took when my indisposition put you back, and that unaptness made your minister thus to excuse yourself. O oh, my good lord, at many times I brought in my accounts, laid them before you. You would throw them off and say you found them in mine honesty. When for some trifling present you have bid me return so much, I have shook my head and wept. Yea, against the authority of manners prayed you to hold your hand more close. I did endure not seldom, nor no slight checks, when I have prompted you in the ebb of your estate and your great flow of debts. My loved lord... Though you hear now too late, yet now's a time. The greatest of your having lacks a half to pay your present debts. Let all my lands be sold. Tis all engaged, some forfeited and gone, and what remains will hardly stop the mouth of present dues. The future comes apace. What shall defend the interim, and at length how goes our reckoning? To Lacedaemon did my land extend. Oh, my good lord, the world is but a word. Were it all yours to give it in a breath, how quickly were it gone. You tell me true. If you suspect my husbandry or falsehood, call me before the exactest auditors and set me on the proof. So the gods bless me, when all our offices have been oppressed with riotous feeders, when our vaults have wept with drunken spilling of wine, when every room hath blazed with lights and brayed with minstrelsy. I have retired me to a, a, a wasteful barrel of wine and set mine eyes at flow. Prithee, no, no more. Heavens, have I said, the bounty of this lord, how many prodigal bits of slaves and peasants this night in glutted? Who is not Timon's? What heart, head, sword, force, means, but is Lord Timon's? Great Timon, noble, worthy, royal Timon. Ah, when the means are gone that by this praise, the breath is gone whereof this praise is made. Feast won, fast lost. One cloud of winter showers, these flies are couched. Come, sermon me no further. No villainous bounty yet hath passed my heart. Unwisely, not ignobly, have I given. Why dost thou weep? Canst thou the conscience lack to think I shall lack friends? <laughs> Secure thy heart. If I would broach the vessels of my love and try the argument of hearts by borrowing men and men's fortunes could I frankly use, and I can bid thee speak. Assurance bless your thoughts. And in some sort, these wants of mine are crowned, that I account them blessings, for by these shall I try my friends. You shall perceive how you mistake my fortunes. I am wealthy in my friends. Within there, Flaminius, Sevilius. Enter three of Timon's servants. My lord, my lord, my lord. I will dispatch you severally. You to Lord Lucius, to Lord Lucullus you. I hunted with his honor today. You to Sempronius. Commend me to their loves. And I am proud, say, that my occasions have found time to use them toward a supply of money. Let the request be 50 talents. The exit. Lord Lucius and Lucullus. Hmm. Go you, sir, to the senators, of whom even to the state's best health I have deserved this hearing. Bid them send the instant a thousand talents to me. 
I have been bold, for that I knew it the most general way, to them to use your signet and your name, but they do shake their heads, and I am here no richer in return. It's true. C- can't be. They answer in a joint and corporate voice that now they are at fall, want treasure, cannot do what they would, are oh, sorry, you are honourable, but yet they could have wished, they know not, something have been amiss, and noble nature may catch a wrench, would all were well, tis pity, and so, intending other serious matters after distasteful looks and these hard fractions, with certain half-caps and cold-moving nods, they froze me into silence. You gods, reward them. Pretty man, look cheerly. These old fellows have their ingratitude in them hereditary. Their blood is caked, tis cold, it seldom flows. Tis lack of kindly warmth, they are not kind. And nature, as it grows again toward earth, is fashioned for the journey, dull and heavy. Go to Ventidius. Pretty, be not sad. Thou art true and honest. Ingeniously, I speak, no blame belongs to thee. Ventidius lately buried his father, by whose death he stepped into a great estate. When he was poor, imprisoned, and in scarcity of friends, I cleared him with five talents. Greet him from me. Bid him suppose some good necessity touches his friend, which craves to be remembered with those five talents. That had... Give it these fellows to whom tis instant due. Yeah, speaker, think that Timon's fortunes among his friends can sink. I would I could not think it. That thought is bounty's foe. Being free itself, it thinks all others so. He exits. It is now Act 3, Scene 1. We, we now get some, uh, some short scenes where those three servants that were just sent off arrive at their destinations. In scene one, enter Flaminius, wanting to speak with a lord from his masters, enters Lord Lucullus's servant to him. I have told my lord of you, he's coming down to you. I thank you, sir. <laughs> Here's my lord. One of Lord Timon's men. Oh, a gift, I warrant. <laughs> Why, this hits right. I dreamt of a silver basin and you were tonight. Flaminius, honest Flaminius, you are very respectfully welcome, sir. Fill me some wine. And how does that honorable, complete, free-hearted gentleman of Athens, thy very bountiful, good lord and master? His health is well, sir. I am right glad that his health is well, sir. And what hast thou there under thy cloak, pretty Flaminius? <laughs> Faith, nothing but an empty box, sir, which in my lord's behalf I come to entreat your honor to supply, who, having great and instant occasion to use fifty talents, hath sent to your lordship to furnish him, nothing doubting your present assistance therein. <laughs> la, 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 la. Nothing doubting, says he. Uh, alas, good Lord. A noble gentleman tis, if he would not keep so good a house many a time and off. I've dined with him and told him on it, and come again to supper to him, of, of purpose, to have him spend less. And yet he would embrace no counsel, take no warning by my coming. Every man has his fault, and honesty is his. I've told him on it, but I could ne'er get him from it. Please, your lordship, here is the wine. Flaminius, I have noted thee always wise, here's to thee. Your lordship speaks your pleasure. I have observed thee always for a twardly prompt spirit. Give thee thy due, and one that knows what belongs to reason. And canst use the time well, if the time use thee well. Good parts in thee. Get you gone, Syrup. Draw nearer, honest Flaminius. Thy lord 
art's a bountiful gentleman, but thou art wise, and thou knowest well enough, although thou comest to me, that this is no time to lend money, especially on bare friendship without security. Here's three solid days for thee, good boy. Wink at me and say thou thirst me not. Fare thee well. Is it possible the world should so much differ and that we alive have lived? Fly, damned baseness, to him that worships thee. What? How I see thou art a fool and fit for thy master. May these add to the number that may scald thee. Let molten coin be thy damnation, thou disease of a friend, and not himself. Has friendship such a faint and milky heart, it turns in less than two nights? Oh, you gods, I feel my master's passion. This slave, unto his honor, has my lord's meat in him. Why should it thrive and turn to nutriment when he is turned to poison? Oh, may the diseases only work upon it, and when he's sick to death, let not that part of nature which my lord paid for be of any power to expel the sickness, but prolong his hour. Meanwhile, across town in uh, Act 3, Scene 2, enter Lucius, who is a different person than Lucillus or uh, Lucullus. This is Lord Lucius. <laughs> <laughs> with three strangers. Who? The Lord Timon? He is my very good friend and an honorable gentleman. We know him for no less, though we are but strangers to him. But I can tell you one thing, my lord, in which I hear from common rumors. Now, Lord Timon's happy hours are done and past, and his estate shrinks from him. Fie, no. Do not believe it. He cannot want for money. But believe you this, my lord, that not long ago, one of his men was with the Lord Lucullus to borrow so many talents. Nay, urged extremely for it and showed what necessity belonged to it, and yet it was denied. How? I tell you, denied, my lord. What a strange case was that. Now before the gods, I am ashamed on it. Denied that honorable man? There was very little honor showed in it. For my own part, I must needs confess I have received some small kindnesses from him, as money, plate, <laughs> jewels, and such like trifles, nothing comparing to his, yet had he mistook him and sent to me, I should never have denied his occasion so many talents. Enter time and servant, Servilius. See by good hap, yonder's my lord. I have sweat to see his honor, my honored lord. Servilius! You are kindly met, sir. Fare thee well. Commend me to thy honorable, virtuous lord, my very exquisite friend. May it please your honor, my lord hath sent... Ha! What has he sent? I am so much endeared to that lord. He's ever sending. How shall I thank him, thinks thou? And what has he sent now? Has only sent his present occasion now, my lord, requesting your lordship to supply his instant use with so many talents. I know his lordship is but merry with me. He cannot want fifty, five hundred talents. But in the meantime, he wants less, my lord. If his occasion were not virtuous, I should not urge it half so faithfully. Dost thou speak seriously, Servilius? Upon my soul, tis true, sir. What a wicked beast was I to disfurnish myself against such a good time, when I might have shown myself honorable. How unluckily it happened that I should purchase the day before for a little part and undo a great deal of honor. Servilius, now before the gods, I am not able to do the more beast I say. I was sending to use Lord Timon myself. These gentlemen can witness, but I would not. For the wealth of Athens, I have done it now. Commend me bountifully to his good lordship, and I hope his honor will conceive the fairest of me because I have no power to be kind." And tell him this from me. I, I count it one of my greatest afflictions, say that I cannot pleasure such an honorable gentleman. Good Servilius, will you befriend me so far as to use mine own words to him? Yes, sir, I shall. And he exits. I'll look you out a good turn, Servilius. True as you said, Timon is shrunk indeed, and he that's once denied will hardly speed. Do you observe this, Hostilius? Aye, too well. Why, this is the world's soul, and just of the same piece as every flatterer's sport. 
Who can call him his friend that dips in the same dish? For in my knowing, Timon has been this lord's father and kept his credit with his purse, supported his estate. Nay, Timon's money has paid his men their wages. He ne'er drinks, but Timon's silver treads upon his lip. And yet, oh, see the monstrousness of man when he looks out in an ungrateful shape. He does deny him in respect of his. What charitable men afford to beggars. Religion groans at it. For mine own part, I never tasted Timon in my life, nor came any of his bounties over me to mark me for his friend. Yet I protest for his right noble mind, illustrious virtue, and honorable carriage. Had his necessity made use of me, I would have put my wealth into donation. And the best half should have returned to him, so much I love his heart. But I perceive men must learn now with pity to dispense, for policy sits above conscience. And those three strangers exit, who were not Appomantis nor Alcibiades. They were different people, <laughs> despite the similarity of voices. Uh, we're now in Act 3, Scene 3. Enter a third servant. Who we're going to call, what What name did I give it to, Dylan? Snivilius. <laughs> Snivilius. <laughs> with Lord Sempronius, another of Timon's friends. Must he needs trouble me in it? Huh. Above all others? But he might have tried Lord Lucius or Lucullus, and now Ventidius is wealthy too, whom he redeemed from prison. All these owes their estate son to him. My lord, they have all been touched and found base metal, for they have all denied him. How? Have they denied him? Has Ventidius and Lucullus denied him, and does he send to me? Three. <laughs> huh. Oh, it shows but little love or judgment in him. Must I be his last refuge? His friends, like physicians, thrive, give him over. Must I take the cure upon me? He's much disgraced me in it. I'm angry at him. That might have known my place. I see no sense for it, but his occasions might have wooed me first. For in my conscience I was the first man that ever received gift from him. And does he think so backwardly of me now that I'll requite it last? No so it may prove an argument of laughter to the rest and monks lords be thought a fool. I'd rather than the worth of thrice the sum had sent to me first, but for my mind's sake I'd such a courage to do him good. But now return, and with their faint reply this answer join, who baits mine honour shall not know my coin. Excellent. Your lordship's a goodly villain. The devil knew not what he did when he made man politic. He crossed himself by it, and I cannot think but in the end the villainies of man will set him clear. How fairly this lord strives to appear foul, takes virtuous copies to be wicked, like those that under hot ardent zeal would set whole realms on fire, of such a nature is his politic love." This was my lord's best hope. Now all are fled, save only the gods. Now his friends are dead. Doors that were never acquainted with their wards, many a bounteous year must be employed now to guard sure their master. And this is all a liberal course allows. Who cannot keep his wealth must keep his house. And so uh, ends Act 3, Scene 3 of Collection Agents, the stage play. Uh, <laughs> we've had three of Timon's collection agents going around uh, to no avail. And now in Scene 4, all the collection agents from the people that Timon owes money to are descending on his house. Enter Varro's man meeting others, all Timon's creditors, to wait for his coming out. Then a servant of Lucius, Titus, and Hortensius. Well met. Good morrow, Titus and Hortensius. Light to you, kind Vero. Lucius, what do we meet together? Aye, and I think one business does command us all, for mine is money. 
So is theirs and ours. Enter Philotus. And Sir Philotus too. Good day at once. Welcome, good brother. What do you think the hour? We're laboring for nine. So much? Is not my lord seen yet? Not yet. I wonder on it. He was wont to shine at seven. Aye, but the days are waxed shorter with him. You must consider that a prodigal course is like the sun's, but not like his recoverable, I fear. Tis deepest winter in Lord Tymon's purse, that is. One may reach deep enough and yet find little. I am of your fear for that. I'll show you how to observe a strange event. Your lord sends now for money. Most true, he does. And he wears jewels now of Tymon's gift, for which I wait for money. It is against my heart. Mark how strange it shows. Tymon in this should pay more than he owes. And even as if your lord should wear rich jewels and send money for them. I'm wary of this charge. The gods can witness. I know my lord hath spent of Tymon's wealth, and now ingratitude makes it worse than stealth. Yes, mine's 3,000 crowns. What's yours? 5,000 mine. Tis much deep, and it should seem by the sum your master's confidence was above mine, else surely his had equaled. Enter Flaminius. Ah, one of Lord Tymon's men. Flaminius! Sir, a word. Pray, is my lord ready to come forth? Uh, no. No, indeed he is not. We attend his lordship. Pray signify so much. I uh, need not tell him that. He knows you are too diligent. Flaminius exits, but Flavius, the steward, enters in a cloak muffled. Ha! Is not that his steward muffled so? He goes away in a cloud. Call him! Call him! Do you hear, sir? By your leave, sir. What do you ask of me, my friend? We wait for certain money here, sir. Ah, if money were as certain as you're waiting, t'was sure enough. Why then preferred you not your sums and bills when your false masters ate of my lord's meat? Then they could smile and fawn upon his debts and take down the interest into their gluttonous moors. You do yourself but wrong to stir me up. Let me pass quietly. Believe it, my lord and I have made an end. I have no more to reckon, he to spend. Aye, but this answer will not serve. If t'will not serve, tis not so base as you, for you serve knaves. Flavius exits. How, what does his cashiered worship mutter? No matter what, he's poor, that's revenge enough. Who can speak broader than he that has no house to put his head in? Such may rail against great buildings. Enter Servilius, time and servant. Ah, here's Servilius. Now we shall know some answer. If I might beseech you, gentlemen, to repair some other hour, I should derive much from it. For, take it of my soul, my lord leans wondrously to discontent. His comfortable temper has forsook him. He's much out of health and keeps his chamber. (laughs) Many do keep their chambers and not sick. And if it be so far beyond his health, methinks he should the sooner pay his debts and make a clear way to the gods. Good gods. We cannot take this for answer, sir. Servilius, help! My lord, my lord! Enter Timon in a rage. What, are my doors opposed against my passage? Have I been ever free, and must my house be my retentive enemy, my jail? The place which I have feasted Does it now, like all mankind, show me an iron heart? Put in now, Titus. My lord, here is my bill. Here's mine. And mine, my lord. And And ours, ours, my my lord. lord. All our bills. Knock me down with them. Cleave me to the girdle. Alas, my lord. Cut my heart in sums. Nine fifty talents. Tell out my blood. Five thousand crowns, my lord. Five thousand drops pays that. What, yours? And yours? My lord. My lord. Tear me. Take me. And the gods fall upon you. Exit Timon. Faith, I perceive, our masters may throw their caps at their money. These debts may well be called desperate ones, for a madman owes them. 
they all exit. Now we're at Act 3, Scene 5. Presumably, the steward went to uh, Ventidius and also begged and didn't get the money. It seems we could have used a fourth scene of people harassing him for money, but... (laughs) (laughs) Enter Timon and Flavius. They have even put my breath from me, the slave creditors! Devils! My dear lord... What if it should be so? My lord... I'll have it so, my steward. Here, my lord. So, fitly... Go bid all my friends again. Lucius, Lucullus, and Sempronius. All lugsers, all. I'll once more feast the rascals. Oh, my lord, you only speak from your distracted soul. There's not so much left to furnish out a moderate table. Be it not in thy care. Go. I charge thee, invite them all. Let in the tide of knaves once more, and my cook and I'll provide. He exits. Now, act three, scene six. The tension is rising. Except, wait, this is the B plot. We're, we're, we're now leaving time and enter three senators at one door. Alcibiades meeting them with attendance. My lord, you have my voice to it. The fault's bloody. Tis necessary he should die. Nothing emboldens sin so much as mercy. Most true. The law shall bruise him. Honor, health, and compassion to the Senate. Now, Captain. I am an humble suitor to your virtues, for pity is the virtue of the law, but none but tyrants use it cruelly. It pleases time and fortune to lie heavy upon a friend of mine, who in hot blood hath stepped into the law, which is past depth, to those that without heed do plunge into it. He is a man setting his fate aside of comely virtues, nor did he sold the fact with cowardice and honor in him which buys out his faults, but with a noble fury and fierce spirit, seeing his reputation touched to death, he did oppose his foe, and with such sober and unnoted passion, he did behave his anger, ere twas spent, as if he had proved an argument. You undergo too strict a paradox, striving to make an ugly deed look fair. Your words have took such pains as if they labored to bring manslaughter into form and set quarreling upon the head of valor, which indeed is valor misbegot and came into this world when sex and factions were newly born. He's truly valiant that can wisely suffer the worst that man can breathe and make his wrongs his outsides, to wear them like his raiment carelessly and never prefer his injuries to his heart to bring it into danger." If wrongs be evils and enforce us kill, what folly tis to hazard life for ill. My lord. You cannot make gross sins look clear. To revenge is no valor but to bear. My lord, then under favor, pardon me, if I speak like a captain. Why do fond men expose themselves to battle and not endure all threats? Sleep upon and let the foes quietly cut their throats without repugnancy? If there be such valor in the bearing, what makes we abroad? Why, then women are more valiant that stay at home, if bearing carry it, and the ass more captain than the lion, the fellow loaded with irons wiser than the judge. If wisdom be in suffering, O my lords, as you are great, be pitiful good. Who cannot condemn rashness in cold blood? To kill, I grant, is sin's extremest gust. But in defense, by mercies, tis most just. To be in anger is impiety. But who is man that is not angry? Weigh up but the crime with this. You breathe in vain. In vain. His service done, and Lacedaemon and Byzantium were a sufficient briber for his life. What's that? Why, I say, my lord, he's done fair service, and slain in fight many of your enemies. How full of valor did he bear himself in the last conflict and make plenteous wounds? He has made too much plenty with him. He's a sworn rioter. He has a sin that often drowns him and takes his valor prisoner. If there were no foes, that were enough to overcome him. In that beastly fury, he has been known to commit outrages and cherish factions. Tis inferred to us his days are foul and his drink dangerous. He dies. Hard fate! He might have died in war, my lords, if not for any part in him. Though his right arm might purchase his own time and be in debt to none, yet more to move you. 
Take my desserts to his and join them both. And for I know your reverend ages love security. Upon my victories, all my honor to you upon his good returns. If by this crime he owes the law his life, why let the war receiveth in valiant gore, for its law is strict and war is nothing more. We are for law. He dies. Urge it no more on height of our displeasure. Friend or brother, he forfeits his own blood that spills another. Must it be so? It must not be. My lord, I beseech you, you know me. How? Call me to your remembrances. What? I cannot think, but your age has forgot me. It could not be else. I should prove so base to sue and be denied such common grace. My wounds ache at you. Do you dare our anger? Tis in few words, but spacious in effect. We banish thee forever. Banish me? Banish your doted. Banish usury. That makes the Senate ugly. If after two days shine Athens contain thee, attend our way to your judgment. And, not to swell our spirit, he shall be executed presently. The senators exit. Now the gods keep you old enough that you may live only in bone, that none may look upon you. I am worse than mad. I have kept back their foes while they have told their money and let out their coin upon large interest. I, myself, rich only in large herds. All those for this? Is this the balsam that the usering senate pours into the captain's wounds? Banishment? It comes not ill. I hate not to be banished. It is a cause worthy my spleen and fury that I may strike at Athens. I will cheer up my discontented troops and lay for hearts. Tis honor with most lands to be at odds. Soldiers should brook as little wrong as gods. And he exits. All right, so that was a nice little diversion from the story of Timon that uh, one of his, his guests, Alcibiades there, has run into some trouble. One of his soldiers was being a uh, committed to death for a war crime and now he's chosen uh exile and he he hates athens and we'll see what happens with that but not quite yet because we got one more scene of act three where we go back to well it just says enter diverse friends lords and senators at several doors but i believe we're back at timon's again the good time of day to you sir i also wish it to you i think this honorable lord did but try us the other day Mm, upon that were my thoughts tiring when we encountered. I hope it is not so low with him as he made it seem in the trial of his several friends. Well, it should not be, by the persuasion of his new feasting. I should think so. He has sent me an earnest inviting, which many of my near occasions did urge me to put off, but uh, he hath conjured me beyond them, and I must needs appear. In like manner was I in debt to my importunate business, mm. but he would not hear my excuse. I am sorry when he sent to borrow of me that my provision was out. Uh, I am sick of that grief, too, as I understand how all things go. Every man here is so. What would he have borrowed of you? A thousand pieces. A thousand pieces? Mm. What of you? Mm, he sent to me, sir. Oh, here he comes. Ah. Enter a time in and attendance. <laughs> With all my heart, gentlemen both, and how fare you? Ever at the best, hearing well of your lordship. The swallow <laughs> follows not summer more willingly than we, your lordship. Nor more willingly leaves winter. Such summer birds are men. Gentlemen, our dinner will not recompense this long stay. Feast your ears with the music a while. If they will fare so harshly the trumpet sound, we shall toot presently. I, I hope it remains not unkindly with your lordship that I returned you an empty messenger. Oh, sir, let it not trouble you. I... My noble lord. Ah, my good friend, what cheer. And the banquet is brought in. My most honorable lord, I am even sick of shame that when your lordship this other day sent to me, I was so unfortunate a beggar. Think not on, sir. If you had sent but two hours before... Let it not cumber your better remembrance. Come, bring in all together. Oh, all covered dishes. Royal chair, I warrant you. 
Doubt not that, if money in the season can yield it. Ah, how do you? What's the news? Alcibiades is banished. Hear you of it? (gasps) Alcibiades banished? Banished? Mm, Tis so, be sure of it. How? How? I pray you, upon what? My worthy friends, will you draw near? I'll tell you more anon. Here's a noble feast toward. This is the old man still. Will it hold? Will it hold? It does, but time will, and so... I do conceive. Each man to his stool, with that spur as he would to the lip of his mistress. Your diet shall be in all places alike. Make not a city feast of it, to let the meat cool ere we can agree upon the first place. Sit! Sit! The gods require our thanks. You, great benefactors, sprinkle our society with thankfulness. For your own gifts, make yourselves praised, but reserve still to give, lest your deities be despised. Lend to each man enough that one need not lend to another. For were your godheads to borrow of men, men would forsake the gods. Make the meat be beloved more than the man that gives it. Let no assembly of twenty be without a score of villains. If there sit twelve women at the table, let a dozen of them be as they are. The rest of your foes, O God, the senators of Athens, together with the common tag of people, what is amiss in them, you gods, make suitable for destruction. For these, my present friends... As they are to me nothing, so in nothing bless them. And to nothing are they welcome. Uncover dogs and lap. What does this lordship mean? I know not. May you a better feast never behold, you not of mouth, friends. Smoke! And lukewarm water is your perfection. This is Timon's last, who, stuck and spangled with your flatteries, washes it off and sprinkles in your faces, you reeking villainy. Live loathed and long, most smiling, smooth, detested parasites, courteous destroyers, affable wolves, meek, Bears, you fools of fortune, trench your friends, times flies, cap and knee slaves, vapors and minute jacks, of man and beast the infinite malady, crust you quite o'er. What does so go? Soft, take thy physic first, thou too, and thou stay, I will lend thee money, borrow none. The Lord's exit. What? All in motion? Henceforth be no feast whereat a villain's not a welcome guest. Burn house. Sink, Athens. Therefore hated be of Timon, man, and all humanity. And now we cut to the, uh, I guess, the foyer where the, 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 the lords that just left the previous scene are here. Now, oh, now, my lords. Know you the quality of Lord Timon's fury? Uh, push, did you did you see my cap? I have lost my gown. No, oh, he's but a mad lord, and not but humors sways him. He gave me a jewel the other day, and now he's beat it out of my hat. Did you see my jewel? D- did you see my cap? Here tis. Here lies my gown. Let's make no stay. Lord Timon's mad. I feel it upon my bones. One day he gives us diamonds, the next day stones. All the lords and senators exit, and so we conclude Act 3. Oh man, there was a rough last feast where he just gave them just empty plates. Well, he had, what, smoke? Well, well I think they weren't empty. I water think they had, water. Uh, they had cold water and stones, stones. in them. Stones. So when he talked about, he was, he was throwing like water, water at stones, them, right. and then when he says, I'm giving you money, he's actually chucking stones at them, which is why they run off. It's kind of one that you have to see that one. It doesn't quite work uh, unless you see it on stage, but it's a great ending yeah. to the first half. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>